Before we start this video, a large thank you to Thibaut, Robbie, Aiden, Lovnary69, Lost Emerald, Feeling Good, Caesar, Doiza, and XR Dev for their support on Patreon. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And an immense thank you to Halo Burner and Porgello for their continued and immense support to the channel this month on Patreon. It is greatly appreciated, gentlemen. I hope you enjoy the video. Hello, guys. So before we jump in and start lighting, I just want to talk about a couple things to consider. So if you're into art, you probably know about color theory. You should consider this when designing your layouts uh, for lighting. So basically, you want to choose colors that just go well together and are appealing to the eyes. Um, there's obviously some cases where you might want to use different colors to draw attention to something or to change the vibe intentionally. But when you're making lighting, it is always uh, nice to consider color theory. Now, to layer on top of this, lighting also conveys a mood and atmosphere. So you really want to think about that whenever you're designing your level. Uh, when you get to the lighting stage, what do I want to make the player feel when I'm going through these areas? So a great example of this is we have the catacombs in Elden Ring uh, with the, the white, bluish white candlelight. And it feels very cold in there and dead. And I feel like that's the uh, vibe they were going for. But sometimes you just pick lighting because you think it looks good and that's cool too. But it does help with conveying a tone. Okay, let's jump to the project. If I hover over these little icons in the scene view, you see this is uh, basically there's an unlit and a shaded draw mode. Let's go to the shaded draw mode so we actually get the lighting here. So there's no lighting baked currently and nothing in the scene that's going on. And this is my little level I've done the design of. You can see we have a skybox and a directional light. So you can see the directional light is leaking through. You can know this because if I rotate the directional light, you can see the lighting changes. Now, this is because a lot of these uh, models here don't really have a back to them. And what a lot of developers will do is make like a box around areas like this. Um, some asset packs probably come with one. Like here we have a background uh, black box here. This is in the polygon dungeon set. And you could just expand this over the area like so if you wanted to, or basically encase the catacombs itself in this uh, black box. And that would block out that lighting from getting into uh, the catacombs or the dungeon rather. But instead of doing that, I am just going to remove the directional light because I'm only going to have my level just in the small little area here to showcase some lighting. So I'm just going to disable that for now. And I'm going to delete this black box. And now we can go back into here and let's talk about lighting and how we're going to set up in this room. So I'm not a lighting expert. I have lots of hours in it, but I would not call myself an expert. So there are things I do though to use uh, to guide where I place my lighting. First off, obviously torches and candles, wherever you can put lighting in a natural area, uh, you should do that. Sometimes you can't do that. So you just kind of have to put some lighting in the area for the sake of it. But most times it will be great to have a natural lighting source. So I am going to put some flames here in these torches, and this serves two purposes. One, it's going to light up the room, but two, light can be used to subtly guide the player to where they need to go. So the light on these two torches here against the shortcut gate is going to show the player that they can't get through here because they're going to approach it, but they're going to be able to see into the room where they're supposed to be able to get to. So again, it's serving two purposes. It's going to guide the player uh, and also light the room. So let's right click and create a light here. I'm going to create a point light. Really, the only two you're going to be using most of the time, uh, aside from your directional light, which is your skylight, is a point light or a spotlight. So you're probably going to be using a point light the most of the time. So you can see here we have range and we have intensity. So we're going to play around that in a second. But you can see the other option here is a spotlight. And you can edit the length and kind of the width of the spotlight. And you can kind of change the direction, how it's pointing down. So this is going to be a pretty fast crash course. I'm not going to dive into anything uh, too in-depth. I'm going to give you kind of a general uh, overall um, quick video on setting up some basic lighting. And if you have any specific questions about any of the settings or practices, please post in the comments and I can cover it in more depth if you want. So I'm going to copy the world transform my torch and I'm going to place my light there. Now, obviously you want your light to match the lighting of the torch. So if you have like a yellowish orange flame, your light should probably be yellowish or orangish. And if you're like me, you're probably going to play around with colors for a very long time until you kind of get the vibe you're going for. You might rebake this like a dozen or more times. That's okay. It's a part of the process. Going to duplicate this and put this over here now. So now these aren't baked, so it's not really doing anything. It's giving me a preview where the light's going to go. If you go to my lighting settings, but if you don't have this window, you can go to window and then you can go down to rendering and hit lighting and it will give you this tab. If I go to my lighting settings, you can see here I have uh, no lighting settings in my scene. We're going to get to adaptive pro volumes later. I have lighting data, but if I go to my scene tab up here, I don't have any lighting settings assets. So create a new one if you don't have it. And I'm just going to call this world light settings. 
Okay, so there are multiple types of lighting you can have here. You can do uh, lighting mode shadow mask is what I'm going to use, or you can do baked indirect or subtractive. You can take a look at the differences between those depending on what kind of style of lighting you want to go for or what the look you want to go for. There are a few settings too that will impact your game performance. They are resolution, padding, size, compression, and directional mode. So all of these settings will impact your game's performance. Everything else will only impact the length of the light map how long it takes to bake. So basically near the end of development, you want to crank all those other settings up because it won't impact your performance. It just will make the light map bake take a lot longer. But again, resolution, padding, light map size, compress, and the directional mode, the compression and directional mode will all affect your game's performance. Now if we click bake, you can see not much happens. Like something kind of happens, but not really. Now we got to do a couple things before we move ahead and I will tell you what to do. So if you're buying assets from the Unity Asset Store, a lot of the time, uh, if you go to their model, their FBX model, you can see here that there is no box ticked for generate light map UVs. A lot of times these don't have light map UVs. So highlight all your FBXs, all your models, not the prefabs, not to be confused with those. Go to the model tab and tick generate light map UVs. Uh, basically, if you baked and got weird artifacts, a lot of the times this will fix that. It'll generate UVs and you won't get those weird things occurring. But we actually didn't really bake anything. Why is that? Well, we're doing baked lighting, which can only be used on static objects. If I go to any of my prefabs here, I can see that basically none of these are static. So likewise, if you buy assets from the new asset store, sometimes they will uh, have these boxes ticked ahead of times. Other times they won't. In this case, for the polygon dungeon set, none of these are marked as static, which means that basically lighting cannot be baked onto any of these items uh, because they're not ticked off uh, for such case. So tick static under all these prefabs, you can highlight them all at once. I'm gonna do that and I will be right back. So I'm just gonna do floors and my props and I'll leave something on tick to show you the difference. Okay, static, static. Yes, change children. And let's go back to the lighting again. Let's do generate lighting and uh, whoop, I forgot. So if you have it on progressive CPU and you have a good GPU, uh, don't run it, just cancel it and then change the light mapper from progressive CPU to progressive GPU and it will run a whole lot faster if your GPU is good. So in my case, it's much better to do this, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that real fast. And then I'm gonna let this bake, and I will be right back. Okay, so it's baking. You can see the timer's going down. It started off at 51 minutes, but it's declining very rapidly. So I think this should take probably like 10 minutes, maybe less, to be honest. Um, it's gonna keep going down, and I will be right back. And we have it baked. So here we go. Looks a lot different. You can see here this rug did not have static ticked, so you can see how no lighting really applied to it. But everything else in the room was given some lighting. So. I'm going to go to all my props now and do the same thing. I'm going to hide this and I'm going to click static. And we're going to change children. Yes. And now I'm going to rebake this again in just a moment. Okay, we're back. First, before I rebake it, I'm going to add a volume, a global volume for post processing. So we can also play around with the lighting settings and how things look in this too. So create, add a volume, and then add a new post processing profile. And then from here, we can actually add post processing effects. So some things to consider, bloom, but please don't crank it up. A lot of games crank the bloom, it looks kind of ridiculous. You could also install post-processing uh, here in the Unity registry. Not sure if you still need to do this to get post-processing effects. Um, I'm assuming you probably don't since it let me create the volume, but I'm going to install it anyway. So if I go in here now and I edit the intensity of the bloom, it will actually, basically anything that's really bright, it gives it a blooming effect. And you can edit things too, like threshold and scatter, play around the settings. I'm also gonna add a tone mapper. I actually use aces for Nephilim, but you can see how dark it makes it. So if you do use tone mapping and use something like aces, you gotta kind of offset the darkness by bringing up the uh, general amount of light in the scene, either through lighting in your scene or through other things in post-processing. So we can add a vignette too, basically make the edges a little bit darker. Looks kind of cool to give it a cinematic look. Don't go overboard with it though, because it can be a bit annoying, but if you add just a little bit there, tastefully, it's quite nice. Uh, it's always good to, to add toggles for these options in your game so you can turn it off if the player doesn't like it. Now let's go and also add color adjustments. This one's pretty cool. You can add post exposure to the scene. So what does this do? Well, you can basically amp up the general lighting in the scene like that. Good to pair that with something like uh, Aces because it can just lift up the scene's lighting a bit uh, via the exposure. So I'm gonna put it up a little bit because we got a, a dark area here and I'm going to, you can also play in the contrast. So, you know, a game like Dark Souls 3 kind of has uh, low contrast in some areas when spells have high contrast. It's cool to play around with stuff like that. You do saturation. Uh, wouldn't recommend doing a huge shift unless there's a very specific uh, style or tone you're going for. But lots of stuff to play around with. Another thing I use quite frequently is, let me just go through the list here, 
Um, shadows, midtones, and highlights. So if you take all these boxes here, you can actually bring it highlights more. Just pay attention to the flame or the bright colors or kind of bring it down. Likewise, too, you can bring up the midtones uh, or bring them down and do the same thing with the shadows. You can make them kind of like lighter or darker. See, so it's another way to, to passively bring up how bright your scene is. Um, so if I were to play with this right now and then put on tone mapping, uh, tone mapping, bring it back to aces and kind of crank this up a little bit and then also lift the post exposure, you can see here there's a really nice amount of contrast between the lighting and the darkness while still having uh, the scene not be too dark. But then we can also lower our bloom because the light kind of looks a little bit too bright there for me. So again, after playing around with it, you can come to something that you like. I've added another light here via the chandelier. And since the chandelier is kind of like big and round, I've added two light sources, one uh, kind of to the left and one to the right, just to give the room some more general light. I'm gonna play around the range and the intensity. Lighting is just a lot of trial and error to kind of get the scene looking nice. It's probably gonna take you a bit, honestly. I think world design and lighting is what takes up the most of my time. Mostly because of all the trial and error. I'm sure people who are better at this than me can kind of set up the scene much faster. But for me, it just takes a lot of playing around. Okay, so after I made the intensity and the range, whatever I wanted, I'm going to rebake this momentarily. And then we're going to talk about uh, light probes and lighting real-time objects like your player. First of all, I'm going to set the max light map size to 512 and the light map resolution to 20. I'm going to rebake it. Okay, so I'm also gonna throw in some dust in the scene just to add some more ambience here. It's a dusty catacomb or dungeon. Can I delete this? These are too big. I'll try using this little preset here that's a bit smaller. Okay, so now we have some lighting. We got some post-processing, get a couple effects in the scene. The scene has a little bit of set dressing. Let's go to the camera. Make sure your post-processing box is ticked here. Otherwise you won't be able to see it when you go into the scene. Now, if I go into the scene, this looks pretty cool, to be honest. Uh, but my player, as you can see, is very bright for some reason. And this is because my player is a real-time object. So obviously, bake lighting can't apply to it. It obviously wasn't here at the time of the bake either. So how do we deal with that? Well, we're going to use a thing called light probes. Now, disclaimer, there are, there's a way to do this. You can see here, by the way, the player's not static. That's very tedious that I don't do. But I'm going to show you it because for some reason, this is uh, how a lot of tutorials show it. You go into the scene. First off, you can tick this 3D icons box. You want to see the same view that I have and you can increase their size. Go to light and go to light probe group. And then I'm going to put this right below this carpet here. You can see it makes a box of probes. Now it says here you can open the light pre uh, probe editor to kind of like change the location of each of these little yellow orbs. Um, that's all well and good. I'm not going to do that though. I'm just going to duplicate a couple of these like this. And then I'm going to uh, kind of make a row of them because I'm gonna walk through them and show you that these actually change the look of real-time objects. So just like this. So you can imagine that placing a lot of these will be very tedious if you have a massive map, which is what I thought too. So I'm gonna show you an alternative after I place a few of these. Um, I think there's a few alternatives on the asset shop, but I'll just show you the one that I've used in the past. So I'm gonna place a little row of these like so. I'm gonna bake my lighting again and leave. Now if I drop back in my player, you can see here, I'm actually getting the shadows of where these probes are. So if the probe is in a light, and I walk into it, my player is lit up. Likewise, if I walk into the darkness, he goes dark. So basically light probes with bake lighting uh, is the old fashioned way to do it. And the way I'm still doing it with Nephilim. But there's recently a new thing to come out. I'll get to that in a minute. So before we move on to the new thing, I use a an asset called Magic Light Probes by Eugene B. Basically this auto fills your scene with light probes. You gotta fill in some parameters and kind of set it up but it will basically scan the scene using some raycasts, I believe, and auto-place light probes near Geo. Um, so this is a great way if you don't want to do it manually, but like I just said, Unity has a new thing out now that most people are probably gonna start using because it negates the necessity for things like this. The new thing is called uh, adaptive probe volumes, and they're basically just a set of volumes that have these probes into them they do something very similar to what this uh, Acid Magic Light Probes do. And they act as your lighting all in one. Now, I'm going to go over that very briefly right now. Setup is pretty easy. So all you got to do is go over to the Adaptive Pro Volumes. First, I'm going to delete my, uh, my probes in the scene. Let's clear the lighting in the scene too. And then I'm going to disable post-processing just so we can kind of see how it looks without it. Now, we need to open, because you can see here it says the current URP asset does not support adaptive probe volumes. Open it up and then go to light probe system, use adaptive probe volumes. So I'm not sure uh, about these settings. I'm going to turn the shadow resolution down to about half of what it is. Like I said, this just came out and I've only got a couple hours of experience with this, but it is very easy to set up. So check this out. 
I'm going to close this out now. And all we got to do is right click on the scene. We have to go to light and we're going to do an adaptive pro volume. And there's three settings here you can check out. So you could do these uh, via manual setup. You could do uh, global and scene. I'm going to do global. Uh, I believe global, global encompasses everything uh, in the scene view. I'm not so sure what scene does. Uh, and I think manual is you're kind of manually making the subsections. So then you can go to the lighting settings. You can edit the minimum probe spacing. This is in meters, the minimum distance between each probe. Um, so obviously the lower the distance, the more probes you have in your scene and the maximum spacing. Now if we click generate lighting, it's gonna start doing its thing. The cool thing about this is, is that it is adaptive as the name suggests. So it's going to basically make more probes if you have more dense geo in your scene and automatically kind of sorts it out for you. You can see the lighting has generated and I've skipped ahead via the magic of editing. If I go to the main menu now and pop into the scene, you can see I'm walking around in the game and my character model, even though it is not a uh, static object, is getting the lighting from all of these baked lights in the scene. So that is pretty cool. Uh, right now, as it stands, uh, I did some research, but like I said, only a couple hours. I do know that using adaptive pro volumes at this point in time at the release of this video is a little bit more costly on the performance of your game. Apparently not by very much. So it's still, if you're going to be uh, really anal about your performance, it's still best to use bake lighting and light probes. But um, for the sake of simplicity and how easy this is to use, I'm going to consider using it in the future for all future projects. Um, most likely going to use it. I'm probably going to stick to what I have for now with Nephilim. I might test this and see how it goes because what I got with Nephilim now is pretty good. But uh, this seems to be the way the future is heading for Unity. Now, with all that being said, please bear in mind, Unity, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is rather famous for releasing something. And uh, sometimes it changes dramatically or gets removed completely. So uh, I don't see that happening to this lighting system, although I could be wrong. Uh, as it stands right now, if you're new to lighting, this just seems like a much easier and streamlined way for you to set up your lighting. So I do suggest you check out and use the adaptive probes volume. So now off video, I am going to go ahead and light the rest of my scene. Um, and I'm going to come back in the next video where we can discuss optimizations for your scene. I really wanted to do a video where I showcase on episode 100 a walk through the level and then the setup and we kill a boss and kind of show what we got so far. But I'm so crunched for time this week, I might have to push it back. I won't actually make it as a video in the series, but kind of just like a bonus video to uh, anybody who's new to the series and wants to check out what we've got done so far. I'll just do a walk through the level, kill some enemies, and then go fight the boss. So guys, I know I threw a whole lot of information at you in one video. So please, if you want me to revisit anything I've talked about right now in more detail, just let me know in the comments. I will gladly do so. I'm trying to kind of get you exposed to a bunch of these things at once so you can play around with it. Lighting is a very dense subject, and if I wanted to talk about things specifically, I'd be here for two to three hours. But if I give you a lot of these tools, you can go experiment with yourself. You can look things up that you're interested in, and then come back with questions, and we can talk about it more. So, as always, thank you very much for joining me. A large shout-out and special thank you to my patrons. It's because of each and every one of you I could keep doing this. So, thank you very much. As always, I hope you all have a very lovely weekend, and I will see you guys next week. Yeah.